working with the uh, seller, and you're giving them advice on their obligations by law. We're now getting ready to talk about the Re Residential Property Disclosure Act. Now, relax for a second. Let me tell you a long story about how we got here and the significance of this particular uh, form. Here's what you have already picked up based on the questions that you asked me earlier today. In talking about agency, do you understand that the agents take a huge burden on their shoulder? You're responsible for not, not all material facts. Technically, you're not responsible for all material facts. You're only responsible for the ones that you know or the ones that you reasonably should know. Okay? How about the seller? The seller doesn't have to say anything. I've told you all along, as long as they don't conceal or hide a material fact, they don't have to disclose anything. Agent has to disclose. You've been in the house three times. Seller doesn't have to disclose. They've lived there for 15 years. That doesn't seem fair. So back in the mid-90s, and that's the reason you're not making notes right now, is because it's not a history exam. So don't worry about it. I'll let you know when it's appropriate to take notes. But back in the 90s, the Realtor Association, we have a very good political action committee, RPAC, a Realtor Political Action Not Committee. It's one of the best funded in the country. It's not hard for us to catch the ear of a sympathetic legislator. Okay? So that's what we did. We go to the legislature and we say, listen, does it make sense that the agents have to take all of this liability, but yet the sellers have very little? They've lived there forever. We've only been in the house for a short period of time. Why does that make sense? Can we have the sellers take more responsibility for material representations? That is what we wanted as a, uh, uh, as a realtor association. Okay? So we catch the ear of a sympathetic legislator, and yeah, that makes sense. Let's see if we can put together some legislation. That's all legislation, uh, legislature can do is write legislation. So what we ask for is, can we make the sellers more responsible for material facts? It starts out as a good idea. Have you ever seen legislation be made, though? I mean, it has to go through committees, subcommittees. It has to go through two chambers. And we're talking about state law here. So we're talking about the state legislature, not federal. This is state law. It's kind of like watching sausage be made. What goes in on one end and what comes out on the other end are two dramatically different things. What we asked for was the sellers to be more responsible. What we got was the Residential Property uh, Disclosure uh, Act. Um, I need to find what page this is in the book. Can someone help me find the North Carolina, uh, the uh, Residential Property, today it's called the Residential Property Owners Association Disclosure Statement. What page? 231. 228. 231, somewhere along there, I will tell you where I want you. 232 is where it starts. Y'all just making that stuff now. <laughs> here's where I want you. I want you on page 231, but only for a second, and then I want you on page 232. On 231, it's the front page, and it describes the law a little bit there at the top, and then you see a sig uh, signatures down at the bottom, and it has the property address down at the bottom. Okay? Then when you flip over to the next page, that's where I want you, on page 232. That's where we're going to focus. Okay, now let me remind you. What we asked for, what the Realtor Association asked for is, can we make the sellers more responsible for material disclosures? What we got was this form. Okay, Melissa, will you please read for me the part that's in bold? Now, it's in bold. It's not big, but it is in bold. Tell me what it says. Read it fairly quickly. The following questions address the characteristics and condition of the property identified above about which the owner has actual Stop. About which the owner has what? Actual. Actual knowledge. So when we're asking them a question about this house, are we asking them, is there something wrong? No. We're asking them, are you aware of anything wrong with this uh, house? You can stop reading right there for just a second, Melissa. I want you to now go down and look at the enumerated items, okay? Uh, it'll ask you what the age of the house is. It'll ask you about the plumbing, the roofing, the structure, the water systems, the sewer systems, and things like that. You see where all those questions are being asked? And basically what we're asking is, hey, seller, are you aware of a problem with this? Yes, I know of a problem, and please tell us what it is. No, I'm not aware of a problem, okay? Look at that third column. No representation. no representation. No representation. A seller checking no representation could be saying anything. He could be saying, I don't know how to answer this question, so I'm just going to say no representation. He could be saying, I know of a material defect, and I'm not going to 
tell you. I'm not going to disclose it. No representation is never a lie. Saying no when you know there's a problem, now that's a lie. But saying no representation is not a lie. Okay? You can clearly know there's a problem and still check no representation. So I ask you this question. Did this form really accomplish what we wanted? Did we require the seller to make no. these disclosures? No. Do you remember the question that was asked of me earlier in a question format? And it said the seller must disclose. Do you now know why I said that was not correct? The seller does not have to disclose. We're asking these. This form could only be created by attorneys and politicians. And here's why. This is a mandatory, voluntary disclosure. It's a mandatory, voluntary disclosure. Now let's talk about why it's mandatory. This is actually important. The reason it's mandatory is it's required by all sellers in the state of North Carolina. I want you to start off with the word all, but if you've been in this class long enough, you know all is never going to be the case. There are always going to be exceptions. Okay. So let's start with the word, all sellers in the state of North Carolina are required to fill out this form. You know what I really mean by all? Whether they're using an agent or whether they're doing what? For sale by owner. In other words, the point I'm trying to make to you here is this is a uh, state law. It's not a real estate commission rule. Okay? So all sellers, whether they listen with an agent or whether they're for sale by owner. Are you with me so far? Let me tell you that there are actually, I think, eight exceptions. I'm going to tell you the two major exceptions that you'll run into on a regular basis. New homes sellers are not required to fill this form out. And what I mean by new home sellers, selling a home that has never been lived in. It doesn't have to be a certain date. It just means it's never been lived in. They're exempt. Do you know what you get that's better than this form when you buy most new homes? <coughs> Most new homes come with a warranty. At the end of the day, I'd rather have a warranty than a seller's property disclosure statement, to be honest with you. And foreclosures is the other major exception that you will see. Every once in a while, if you want to just set a threshold for you, I will tell you this. Foreclosures are exempt from most disclosure requirements because the bank never really owned the property. They're just, you know, they took it in by virtue of the fact that they weren't getting paid. Okay. Say again, I'm sorry. Well, all houses are as is, but in fact, in foreclosures, they tell you that it's as is. So, yeah, foreclosures, you'll find to be exempt from most of these disclosure requirements. Those are the two major ones. There's some other ones that are interesting, but these are the two uh, majors, okay? So, all sellers require this. Uh, it's required of all sellers, uh, except for modest exceptions. Now, remember, the sellers are asked to provide these disclosures, but is it true, is it safe to say that it requires the seller to make certain disclosures? No, because they can always check what? The representation. Now here comes the next important bullet point. Who fills this form out? Who fills out the property disclosure statement? The seller does. That is actually more important than what you perceive it to be, okay? The agent does not fill out this form. This is the seller's disclosure to the buyer. Okay? As agents, we have our own disclosure requirement, don't we? If our seller chooses not to represent a material defect, does that absolve us of our obligation as an agent? No. It absolutely does not. It have, you, regardless of what the seller has put on that form, you are still obligated for your, uh, uh, you still have to meet your obligation to disclose material facts. <laughs> Make sense? Okay. The seller fills out this form. If the seller says, well, Chris, you know more about this house than I do, why don't you fill it out? Because this is the seller's disclosure. What do you think I should fill in? You should fill it out the way your conscience allows you to fill it out. Well, you know the house better than me. Can you tell me what to fill? If you have questions, you need to talk to an attorney. Okay? I am not going to tell you how to fill that form out. Okay? This is a seller's disclosure to the buyer. Are you with me on that? Okay. Now, Having said this, this is not my favorite form in all the stuff that we do. I find it to be basically a useless form. Matter of fact, I don't find it to be, to be completely useless. What I actually find it uh, to be is better than nothing. Okay, I think most sellers will make a, an effort to fill it out. 
if they ever talk to an attorney, the attorney's just going to tell them, say, check no representation all the way down. But I mean, that's fair as well. It's an option, okay? I actually use this form more when I go out and I'm trying to find uh, listings. And here's the way I uh, used to use this form. Um, when I was in sales on a regular basis, I used to work for sale by owners, okay? And you say, why in the world would you work for sale by owners? They are literally saying they do not want an agent. That's why they're for sale by owners. Well, the reason I work for sale by owners is because I knew they had a house to sell. You know, when you're just shooting at the general public, you don't know whether they need to buy or sell. But for a sale by owner, I know he has a house to sell, so I would go and try to convert them. So here's the way I would do it. I'm going to knock on their door. Now remember, I'm not calling them, because we got do not call issues to deal with. So I'm just going to knock on their uh, door, and I would provide them some information. I'd say, hey, look, you might want to know about the market. And listen, I honestly want to know about your house, because I have buyers in this area, so I want to know a little bit about your house. Would you allow me to come in and take a look at your house? Oh, yeah, sure, go on. <laughs> so they let me in, and when I walk in, then I just turn into my normal, charming self, and I start trying, trying to flatter them about their house. And I say, you know, green carpet and orange drapes normally don't go together, but you make it look good. <laughs> you know, you're, you're building rapport. You're trying to make them feel comfortable with you, right? Okay. And then at some point, I'm going to ask them, say, look, I know you don't want to work with an agent, but if I bring you a buyer, would you pay me if I brought a buyer? Okay, whatever. We'll talk about it at that time. That's fine. So I'm making a little progress here, right? And then, after I get ready to leave, here's what I uh, always I do. As I'm ready to walk out the uh, house. Are y'all old enough to remember Columbo? Yeah. You know what he always did when he got ready to leave a room? Oh, yeah, one more thing. Yeah. One more thing. I would say, do you have a copy of your uh, property disclosure statement? And uh, they're sellers. I mean, they're unrepresented. You know what they're going to say? About okay. what? Your property disclosure statement. Can, can I just get a copy of it in case I uh, need it? I, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I actually I train myself to have for my eyes to go like real big, like shock. Okay, <laughs> you can actually train yourself to do that. You have to do it in front of the mirror, but you, you can do that. So I would put that shock look, and I would say, "Oh my God, you do not have a copy of the mandatory, the state mandated residential property disclosure statement." I would not want to be you. And then I'd take off of the door. And then they would run and they'd tap me. And they'd say, wow, what's the problem? <laughs> and then they would be thinking, if I did that wrong, well, what else have I done wrong? And then they'd say, will you please list my property? I don't know. I don't know. I'll pay you 7%. 7 <laughs> Do you know what the penalty is? Do you know what the major penalty is? that would befall a seller for not providing the state mandated residential property disclosure statement. What's the penalty that will befall the seller? Nothing. <laughs> the buyer has a three day life rescission. The penalty to the seller for not providing the property disclosure statement is that the buyer will have a three day life rescission. There's a complicated formula for figuring it out. Don't worry too much about that. Worst case scenario for the seller is the buyer enters into a contract, the buyer could have a maximum of three days to back out. Okay? So is that a huge penalty or not? Yeah. Yeah, it's a penalty. I mean, usually buyers don't have the right to walk away, so it is some penalty. But it's not like there's a fine or anything like that. You know what I find interesting about this one? I actually consider the penalty to the agent to be more serious than to the uh, seller. Because if you're an agent, it is your job to make sure that the buyer is aware of their rights and the seller is aware of their obligations. If you don't do this, agent, you're considered to be negligent and you could be subject to disciplinary action. Do you fill this form out for the seller? Heck no. Do you make them aware of their obligation by law? Absolutely. And then when the buyer gets ready to make an offer on that house, do you know when, let's make another baseline right here. Do you know when you should receive all disclosures? When should buyers receive disclosures? Prior to making an offer, or at least simultaneous with making an offer, okay? Because if the buyer gets the disclosures before they make the offer, they don't have a right to rescind, okay? We actually have an easy way of doing this through the MLS. You could post documents on the uh, MLS, and that way when the buyer's agents get ready to make an offer, they can download those documents. There's a box on the offer person contract that they check saying that I received the property disclosure statement. Okay? 
residential property disclosure statement. Brad, was it you that asked the question earlier today about the property disclosure statement? Andrew, it was you. Do you now understand the significance of that particular uh, question? Who fills this form out? Sellers fill this form out. What sellers? Let's start with the word all, and then let's know the major exemptions, new homes and uh, foreclosures. Agents, you are responsible for making sure the parties understand their rights and, and uh, obligations. Got it? Can I get it, out, can I get it outside of you? Remember you used to could get it off the match, you could get it all. Quit claim the contract, the whole nine yards, you could buy the, all the paperwork you needed. Okay. Can they get that without? The property disclosure statement? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could just go Google it today. You could print it offline for free, assuming that you know about it. And see, that's the, that's the issue is most sellers today, unless they've done significant research, they're not going to know about that uh, form. And to be quite honest with you, most for sale by owners, unless there's an agent involved, I doubt seriously if it's done. I doubt seriously if it's done. Okay. No representation No representation is not saying, I don't know. It's saying, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> That's what it is, right there. Uh, back in when the when the form initially came out, uh, when people checked no representation, I feel like it kind of put a stain because agents were thinking, oh man, there's something they're not telling us. Let's be very careful about uh, this. Today, it's so common for people to check no representation that I, it normally doesn't raise my hackles that much. I will tell you this though. To some extent, I, as a buyer's agent, I prefer it when they check no representation because as a buyer's agent, I was going to recommend my buyer get an inspection anyway, right? But if they have no representation, I can say, now you see why you really need to have an inspection. They obviously have something to hide. It just makes it easier to justify than spending four or five hundred bucks for an inspection to do that. I was going to recommend an inspection anyway. Speaking of which, uh, for test purposes, please make sure you understand this. Whether your buyer does an inspection or not, doesn't change the fact that we or agents are still obligated for material facts. So we can't say, well, Your Honor, he had a right to do an inspection, he didn't do it, so that should absolve me. Wrong <clears throat> well, answer for an agent. Seller can get by with that, agent can't get by with that. Yes, Lauren? When do we have them, the buyer initial and date does? The buyer or the seller? The buyer. This is down here. The purchaser would do it at the time that they receive it. Typically, at the time that they're making an offer. Okay. So okay. when you submit the offer, do you, do you have this with it, or do you wait till the offer's been accepted? Then no, no, no. At the time you make the offer. Okay. Yeah. If you wait until after it's accepted, unfortunately, the buyer would have this three-day okay. right okay. decision. Okay. Good question. Yes. So if something on this list is checked off as yes, and this is being given to the buyer before they're making an offer, yeah. What as a seller do you have as an obligation to give them the terms of information? I mean, seller doesn't have any obligation for anything. Uh, if they say yes, then they're telling you there's a problem. And yeah. theoretically, on that form, they should tell what the problem is. But I mean, there's no obligation by law to do that. It's just, yeah, I have a problem. Well, what's the problem? Figure it out. Because on here, I was reading it, it does say blood hazard. We sold a house that was in a flood zone, and we had to put like, blood insurance. Correct. And when we did this, and we had it was a we had to give all these documents to the agents of all of these people, and we were kind of thinking in the back of our heads, like they were asking for the last hundred year floor plan or whatever that we had when we bought the house, uh -huh. and they were asking, they went as far as to ask how much our flood insurance was for the last two years or something like that, and we kept thinking, I don't think we have to dispose of I mean, have to, but it, it would make it easier to sell the house if you would do those things. So because we disclosed it before, like you were saying, they don't have the right to rescind if they have the um, if he goes under contract but didn't know this information, yeah. then no, that, that doesn't give them a right to rescind. You gave them the information, they chose to go under contract anyway. Can they get out? Yeah, but they can get out under due diligence or they can be in breach. All right? But they would not have the right to walk away based on the uh, residential property disclosure statement if you gave it to them prior to yeah. them making an offer. If they were concerned about something on that, they should have had that all figured out before they went under contract. Yeah. You did what you were legally obligated. Okay. Do you actually yeah. have a form, a statement as the representative, as a facilitator, the broker in this? Do you actually have a form? I mean, you just sat here, you listed with them. 
there's three buckets sitting around, three booklets coming yeah. through, but their seller thinks has no representation. Well, now here, okay. We do not have a form. As agents, we don't have a form for this. Right. And, and in some cases, your disclosures are not required to be in writing. They just have to be disclosed. Okay. So what I'm suggesting to you, Constance, is I would have something, even if it was an email, even if there was some way that I could prove it was in writing. Maybe it's in the MLS. Um, yeah, I put in the MLS agent remarks that uh, be aware it is a roof leak. Don't beat me up about it. I told you about it. You may right. be off based on that okay. information. Uh, there's no requirement for most disclosures to be in writing. Now, I mean, there are some requirements. There are some that are required to be in writing. Synthetic stuff on the base paint, right? right? But then these others are not required to be in writing. But come on, it's good common sense right. in some cases to get them in writing. Okay. Seller has a specific form. Agents do not. So your MLS is a good place to put your CYA so. stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And there's, right. and there's a private place so that you don't have to in, you know, hurt right. the hurt the property publicly, right. but at least the agent knows when she goes to see it that be aware of this buyer. Okay. Residence property disclosure. Uh, Thank you. Okay. All right. Now, as long as we're talking about uh, this, I have to tell you another long story to tell you a short point. Okay. So here comes the long story, really, really quick. A few years back, now, we've had the Residential Property Disclosure Act since the mid-90s, okay? But a few years back, we added a disclosure having to do with mineral, oil, and gas rights. What I call the MOD. I call the Residential Property Owner Association Disclosure Statement. I call it the ARPO, and I call this the MOD. That way I don't have to say the words so many times. The mineral oil and gas rights disclosure is actually part of the same act, the Residential Property Disclosure Act. And so it applies to the same properties. So let's start from easy and let's go complicated. Here we go going complicated but fast. Years ago, there was a builder in our uh, area uh, called uh, uh, D.R. Horton. D.R. Horton, good company, by the way. They built a lot of houses in this area. They sold a lot of houses in this area. I have no problems with D.R. Horton. But D.R. Horton is out of uh, Texas. The company, I believe, was started by a old gazillionaire out of Texas. And one of the things that's interesting in Texas is most homeowners in Texas do not own their subsurface rights. Going all the way back to day one, remember, unless they've been taken away, you own to the center of the earth and to the highest heavens. Most people in Texas do not own their subsurface rights because in the past they have been reserved by a boom. Oil. Oil companies. I mean, think about Texas. It used to be a big uh, business in uh, Texas. It may still be for all I uh, know. But uh, subsurface rights, basically oil. Okay? Well, when D.R. Horton was building properties here and selling new homes here, they were using a contract that was very similar to the one in Texas. And what their contract in Texas said is, you're not getting your subsurface rights. Okay? Either they were reserving them for themselves if they already owned them or if they had acquired them at some point. Okay? But we're selling you the house, we're selling you the land, that's what you're going to own, but we're keeping your oil rights on this uh, property. Can you imagine using that same contract in North Carolina? Okay? Well, uh, uh, Neil Horton had been doing this for years, and they had sold hundreds of homes using that contract. And one day, somebody actually decided to read their contract. And after reading this 85-page uh, contract, they ran across a line that said, D.R. Horton reserves the right to reserve the oil rights on this side uh, property. And this person takes it to their attorney and says, what does this mean? And the attorney says, well, it means that they're reserving the oil rights. And the guy basically said, well, does everybody know about this? And apparently people did not know about this. And apparently when people found out about this, it became a big issue. And D.R. Horton has splashed all over the News and Observer and WRAL about their practices. It became a big, big deal for a short period of time. Horton's position is we don't mean anything by it. I mean, the fact of the matter is, this is just our standard contract that we uh, use. After suppression, now, the Horton didn't do anything illegal. Okay? They didn't do anything illegal. After pressure, pressure going all the way up to the state attorney general's office, the Horton eventually said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We will just quit claim your oil rights back to you. So now, individual property owners, bam, you get your oil rights back. Good luck doing anything with them, because unless you plan on putting a dairy on your quarter acre, you're probably not going to be able to do anything with it. But anyway, here, here they are back. 
But because of the controversy that this caused, this goes all the way to the legislature. The legislature said, well, I got an idea. Let's make a law. So that's what they did. They made a law. And so now today, those same sellers that are required to do the residential property disclosure statement are also now required to provide a disclosure that says whether they have ever reserved their mineral oil and gas rights or whether the seller plans on doing that before selling the uh, property. Okay? Do you know whether the uh, oil and gas rights have been uh, reserved? I don't know, to be quite honest with you. I didn't look at the deed that closely when I uh, bought it. Do you plan on not doing it? No, I don't plan on not doing it. We ask the seller these questions. It's now a disclosure uh, obligation that we have. But here comes the testable point. Who created all this, con uh, all this controversy? Which specific seller? D.R. Horton. What does D.R. Horton do? What business is D.R. Horton in? It's building. D.R. Horton builds new homes, right? So here's the difference between the MOG and the ARPO. They have all the same exemptions except for one. New homes are not exempt from the mineral, oil, and gas rights disclosure. Are new homes exempt from providing the ARPO? Yeah. Yes. Are they exempt from providing the MOG? No. no. How do you remember that? It was a new home builder who started this controversy to start with. Okay? At the end of the day, you will find out that that probably is the only important testable point. And then you will find out in the field, it's just another document that the seller is required to sign. We provide it. They fill it out. We put it as part of our materials. We move on. By the way, what if the seller lies on the uh, mineral oil and gas rate? I shouldn't say lie. I shouldn't say lie. If someone reserved rights in this property 85 years ago, I doubt seriously that the seller would even know about it. There's a guy, this guy's actually smart. There's a guy in Sanford that, uh, in Black Park County, says that Lee County? Yeah, Lee County. There's a guy in Lee County that owns, I can't remember what they said, like 1,300 acres of subsurface rights because in the past he had purchased them. Do you know that they used to mine for coal in uh, Sanford? Hey, in Lee County. They used to mine for coal in uh, uh, Lee County. Well, if there's coal, what's there going to be nearby? Oil. Oil, and more importantly today, natural gas. So he owns 1,300 acres of subsurface uh, rights. I doubt seriously that those people would remember when that was uh, done. But he owns it. Okay, it's legitimate. There's somebody else in our uh, state that owns a lot of subsurface rights. You never even think about it. You ever heard of Warehouse, the tree growing company? They actually, when they own property and they resell it, oftentimes they will reserve the subsurface rights. What's that? The, the warehouse is known as the tree growing company. They own a lot of tree uh, farms, especially in the eastern part of the state. But they also will mine for uh, like phosphates and stuff, uh, so, uh, minerals in the uh, soil. Okay, And a lot of times when they sell property, they reserve the rights to uh, do that. So anyway, this is not unheard of. It became controversial when it hit the fan with uh, DR. What's that? When was that? Oh gosh, it was, uh, let I've been here for five years. It's probably, I don't know, maybe seven years ago or something, seven or eight years ago. Okay. I don't remember the, but it'd be very easy to find on a Google search. It's still out there. Okay. What's the testable point? New homes builders do not have to provide the auto, but they do have to provide the model. Make sense? Okay. All right. I'm through talking about those. Okay, you can stop the, uh,